In this video, I want to show how you can approximate the digits of pi experimentally. Here I'm dropping a bunch of toothpicks randomly onto a paper with equally spaced lines. Some of the toothpicks cross the lines and some of them don't. It turns out that I can approximate the value of pi with the following remarkably simple formula that pi is just 2 divided by the probability that you hit a line. So since I count that 19 of my toothpicks don't hit the line and thus 41 of my 60 do, then this is going to give me a value for pi of about 2.92. Okay, that's not amazing, but I only use 60 toothpicks. I can program on the computer toothpicks to randomly land. You can see that the more toothpicks I drop, the closer this probabilistic formula gets to pi. And I could let the program run to a million toothpicks if I wanted to. But why? Why does this formula work? Suppose this is one of the vertical lines that I'm going to hit and let me drop my blue needle at a random spot. I'm going to really think about the midpoint of that needle, which I've highlighted with a little circle. Now I'm going to start by assuming that the midpoint of my needle lies close enough to one of the lines such that it would intersect it if it was rotated horizontally. Later in the video, I'll deal with what would happen if that is not the case and my midpoint is too far away so that it would never intersect. Sometimes the needle hits the line, sometimes it doesn't, but why is pi involved here? Well, if I imagine that that midpoint is fixed for now, we'll move it around soon enough, then I actually get a circle which is all of the ways that I could revolve around that midpoint. And as I rotate that needle, sometimes it's intersecting the yellow line and sometimes it is not. Specifically, it's going to intersect the yellow line if it lies within this shaded region. That is, if, if my needle is aligned so it's in the shaded region, then it will intersect the yellow line, and if it's outside of it, it won't. So if we're fixing the midpoint, this question of what is the probability that I intersect the line is a question of what is the area of the shaded region compared to the area of the entire circle. I can come up with some notation by putting an angle of theta with respect to the horizontal here. And so the shaded region is two copies of these regions that are both an angle of two theta. And so the ratio of these two areas on the bottom, you just have the area of a circle, which is just pi r squared. For the numerator, what is the area of the shaded? Well, the total amount of angle used in these shaded areas is actually 4 theta. On the left, it's 2 theta. On the right, it's 2 theta, so 4 theta overall. And then that 4 theta is a proportion of the total angle of going all the way around a circle, which is 2 pi. And so this gives me 2 theta times r squared. It's my proportion of the total area. If I cancel the two r's, I get 2 theta divided by pi. Okay, so I've made some good progress. My probability is just related to this angle, but how do I get the value of theta? Now, the actual value of theta depends on where you are, where that midpoint was. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the distance from the vertical line that I may or may not intersect to the midpoint to be x. I'm going to make a simplifying assumption here. It's, it's going to cancel out and not matter that the length of my needle is of length 2, which means the radius of my circle is length 1. And doing that, I can just say that by trigonometry, the value of my x is cosine of theta, or more precisely, x divided by the hypotenuse, which I just assumed to be 1, is cosine of theta. x is cosine of theta, theta is arc cosine of x. And so I replace my probability with 2 times arc cosine of x divided out by pi. So now we have this really nice result. If you know how far away your midpoint is from the line, then you can figure out the probability that if you're allowing all of the possible rotations of it, that you will hit the line. It's, it's this thing, 2 arc cosine of x divided by pi. But I don't know where the midpoint is. The midpoint itself could be all sorts of different x values. And in fact, all x values are equally likely we're randomly putting it anywhere we wish. For example, if my x value is a little smaller, if I'm closer to the line, then it's a bigger value of theta. If my x is a little bit bigger, further away from the line, it's a smaller value of theta. So I can't just consider the probability for one value of x. I have to add up those probabilities for all the possible values of x that you could have. Now, I want to emphasize, the probability that I've computed here is for a fixed value of x. And then what this is really computing is the probability that among all the different rotations, what proportion of those rotations are going to intersect the line. 
So now I want to do it for all values of x. And I can do this with an integral. And the reason that the integral goes from 0 to 1 was I had made that simplifying assumption just to make all the math easier that indeed my radius of my circle was precisely 1. So the possible values of x, if I'm assumed to be within the intersection of a line, goes from 0 to 1. Basically what I imagine is for every value of x, you have a different angle heading towards our vertical line. And so I need to add up all of those, in other words, integrate. Now this integral is one that you might remember how to do, you might have forgotten. I'm actually going to switch to maple learn to compute the value of arc cosine between the values of 0 and 1. As you can see, it gives me the value of 1. My thank you, by the way, to maple learn, which is the sponsor of today's video and makes this amazing math software. I can click on the steps button and it's going to show me exactly step by step the integration by parts method to be able to solve this particular integral. Indeed, it's a standard first year calculus integral. Regardless, since the integral of arc cosine was just 1, the probability I get is 2 divided by pi. Now, remember, I had assumed that my x lay within striking distance of one of the lines. It was close enough so that it would hit the line. And indeed, in my animations at the beginning, I just made the gap between the lines and the needle length to be exactly the same thing. But what if it was like this? What if my needles were smaller than the gaps between the lines? Sometimes it can spin around and intersect the line, but sometimes it just can't. That is, if I imagine my needle has a length of L and a gap between the lines a distance D, and so I get these two regions whose width are L divided by 2, where if it was in those regions, it can spin around and be able to intersect the lines. But if it was in the middle here, it doesn't matter how it spins around, it's never going to be intersect the lines. And so the probability that the midpoint was located close enough to do the prior analysis, it's just the ratio of this. The total width of these allowable regions is L over 2 plus another L over 2, or L. The total width is d, and so the ratio of those L divided by d is the probability my midpoint is actually close enough. And so my final formula is just the product of these two things. In order to hit the line, my midpoint needs to be close enough, and then the angle needs to be right. And thus my final formula is 2 divided by the probability of intersecting the line times L divided by d. I ignored L over d in my initial computation because I had chosen them to be the same, and so this ratio was just 1. I won't do it here, but you might like to play around with the scenario of what happens if the gap between the lines is smaller than the needle length, and we have to adjust our probabilities accordingly. Now, there are many approximations for pi. In this video, I showed you Buffin's problem, which is sort of this fun little experimental one. But people aren't really calculating, you know, billions and trillions of digits by doing this experiment. So I wanted to just briefly show you a couple of the other approximations just to sort of spark your curiosity. Here I have a Maple Learn document, and the link to that is down in the description. And a lot of these other ways to approximate pi are all written as series. For example, with the Basel problem, I've done a video on this one before actually showing how to derive this formula. But it's the infamous one that sum of 1 over i squared is just pi squared divided by 6. And you'll notice as I increase the number of terms in my series, I get closer to the value of pi. I'm quite a fan of the 14th century Madhava Leibniz formula. This is four times, and then it's one minus a third, plus a fifth, minus a seventh, plus a ninth, and so forth. The third one I've got for you is the absolutely remarkable Ramanujan's formula. Check out how remarkably accurate and close to pi this is using only the very first two terms. This converges super fast, and, and while not exactly this one is used as sort of the most modern ones, this is sort of the basis of the most modern uh, algorithms that are used for computing out insane numbers of digits of pi on our supercomputers. Sometimes uh, these are written not as infinite series, but infinite products, as in the Wallace product, which again, is also converging to pi. Anyways, this is just scratching the surface of pi approximations, but a big thank you to MapleLearn for sponsoring this video. As you can get a sense here, the big idea of MapleLearn is that it is able to do math inside of your math documents. It's computing out the values of these series on the fly as you change the slider. So definitely check out MapleLearn as well. Link to that is down in the description. If you have any questions or thoughts about this video, leave them down in the comments, and we'll do some more math in the next video.